Hello. Here is Bob Kirkaldi, uh, who's a medical epidemiologist and team lead for the epidemiology research team in the epidemiology and statistics branch of the Division of STD Prevention at CDC. His team conducts a broad portfolio of epidemiological studies and projects, including SURGE, the NEST study of MSM networks and managing STI outbreaks and studies of genomic epidemiology of gonorrhea, chlamydia serology, a possible gynecococcal vaccine, and the prevalence of STIs in vulnerable populations. His main area of expertise is in antimicrobial resistance of Neisseria gonorrhea. Bob, turn it over to you. All right, uh, thank you, Brian. And I'd like to thank the session organizers for inviting me to speak in the symposium. As an overview of my talk, I'll provide a simplified introduction to genomics. I'll then note examples in which the ways in which genomics has been applied to non-STI pathogen surveillance. And lastly, I'll discuss current and potential roles for the use of genomics in STI surveillance. There are more official and more precise definitions of genomics. But for the purposes of this talk, I think we can consider the simplified definition of the study of a genome or string of DNA of a microbe. It might be parts of the entire thing or the study of genomes from populations of microbes. And to generate genomic data, you generally start with a culture of live microbes, such as bacteria. Laboratorians extract DNA, and then the DNA is then run through a sequencer, and the sequencer generates readouts of the individual bases that make up the DNA strand. The person doing the analysis uses a software package to assemble the fragments into a long string of bases that make up the DNA. And sequencing can result in massive data sets. DNA for bacteria or trick can sometimes be millions of bases long. To make sense of it, the person doing the analysis can then compare the new sequence being studied, uh, such as the one I've labeled here as number one, to an existing and well-characterized sequence called a reference sequence. And then look for differences between the two. Very loosely, and for the purpose of this overview, such differences may be considered mutations. And you'll also hear the term SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism, which just refers to differences in single nucleotides between the sequences, such as the T and the C, or the C and the G over on the right that you see on the slide. And then you can add more sequences to the analysis and look for differences between these. And then you can start to organize the sequences into evolutionary relationships. In this example, the reference sequence and number one are relatively similar. So these would be considered more closely related. Number two sequence is relatively different and it would be considered more evolutionary distantly related. And longer branch lengths between isolates indicates greater genetic differences and more evolutionary distance. And in the next few slides, I'll show a few examples of how genomic data can be used and visualized in ways that are relevant to public health and surveillance. This is a phylogenetic, excuse me, a phylogenetic tree of 242 gonococcal isolates from the United States collected in 2009 and 2010. And to orient you, the end of each line on the right side indicates the position of an individual isolate in the tree. Way over on the left side is what this analytic software uh, considers the estimated distant ancestor with then the phylogenetic or family tree branching outward toward the right to where each sequence resides. And like in a family or evolutionary tree, the position of an isolate's genetic sequence and the length of the branches of the tree indicate how related or unrelated they are to each other. For example, these isolates I've circled in red cluster closely together. And the sequences are very similar. And if there's a family tree, these may be considered siblings. And part of the power of genomic analysis and whole genome sequencing is that it approximates epidemiology. Closely related sequences are highly epidemi are likely epidemiologically related, especially if they're occurring in a sexual network or a specific geographic location. This might represent a cluster or an outbreak with recent transmission events. This also suggests the people who've had these infections may be part of the same sexual network. But some discernment is needed when examining potential clusters by just genomics, because occasionally isolates may cluster together genomically, but not be at all epidemiologically related. On the other hand, the sequences I've circled here in green are distantly related. They're very different and very unlikely to be epidemiologically related. 
as I've alluded to previously, the usefulness of uh, sequencing data can be greatly enhanced by incorporating epidemiological data. For example, the phylogeny includes the geographic location of the person who submitted the isolate across the top, and you see in columns, and the gender of their sex partners denoted by red or blue bars. Then we can start to see hints of possible transmission patterns. We'll pop out this grouping that we see across the top of the phylogeny, and there's a cluster of isolates from Honolulu, Hawaii, or uh, abbreviated HON. The red horizontal bars denote that the isolate came from an MSM, and the blue denote it came from an MSW. So this cluster here is mainly from MSM. And then we can see that very closely related sequences were found in isolates from an MSM in San Francisco, an MSW in Las Vegas, and an MSM in Greensboro, North Carolina. And the suggestion of the data is that there may be a sexual network that connects um, uh, these individuals that transmitted the, the strain across these populations and locations. And as a second use of genomics, you can compare the sequences of resistant and susceptible isolates and possibly identify mutations that are causing the resistance. The type of these type of analyses have really been the focus of a lot of the work in NICERA gonorrhea in the last few years, particularly with an eye toward advancing the development of molecular assays for susceptibility. And a third use of genomic data can be defining an outbreak or a sexual network. By, but I by identifying closely related isolates through sequencing and incorporating epidemiological data, we may be able to define an outbreak among people from whom the isolates were collected. And also, if you're interested in sexual networks, you can use genomics to begin to identify the contours of a network. And genomic data also allow you to see if a sequence from a different area, for example, a different country, is closely related to the outbreak or the network that you're interested in, and thus may be connected to it. And this may expand your understanding of the network or outbreak, maybe where it started, where it's going, and it's perhaps the extent of it. But it is important to remember that we can't say who infected whom. Seeing closely related isolates does not mean that the person from whom the specimens were collected were partners of each other. Especially if you have limited sampling like we do in gonorrhea, there are likely to be multiple other unsampled individuals in the sexual network that actually connect the people from whom you have specimens, as demonstrated here by the yellow icons. Oh, sorry. So we can't say who infected whom, um, but we can infer that those with closely related isolates are likely connected somehow within a sexual network. Now, for many STI pathogens, whole genome sequencing has moved beyond research and is being translated into public health and surveillance. And the most common and most mature use is detection of outbreaks or clusters. And this is done for foodborne illnesses through PulseNet and as part of molecular cluster detection in HIV. Surveillance of antimicrobial resistance is done as part of tuberculosis and HIV surveillance. And strain monitoring for evaluation of vaccine impact is done for several vaccine preventable pathogens. And rarely a primary aim, genomic data can be used to understand transmission networks. Uh, for example, is that, uh, excuse me, transmission dynamics. Um, an example is identifying intercontinental spread of drug resistant Shigella. And with all that in mind, how might genomics be used to apply to STI surveillance? This slide lists STI pathogens that I was able to identify as having been sequenced, if only a single specimen. And one challenge is that sequencing bacteria requires live organisms from culture. And because culture of bacterial STIs is often not widely performed, this may limit availability of specimens for sequencing and genomic analysis. Of these pathogens, sequencing of Neisseria gonorrhea has advanced the furthest. And this is where I'll largely focus my discussion of the potential uses of surveillance. And also that will hopefully also uh, whet your appetite for the excellent talk by Dr. Jonathan Brad to come. But I'll also touch on some promising work of sequencing being done in two other uh, bacteria. The use of genomics in Neisseria gonorrhea surveillance is in its early stages, but there has been substantial groundwork laid. In the U.S., cultures are collected for susceptibility testing from, through GISP, Enhanced Gonococcal Isolate Surveillance Project, or EGISP, and also SURGE, all platforms that focus on monitoring susceptibility. Isolates are sent to the Antibiotic Resistance Laboratory Network uh, for susceptibility testing by agar dilution, and a subset of up to 5,000 isolates 
uh, each year undergo whole, gen whole genome sequencing. These sequencing data serve as the foundation for learning to apply genomics to public health and surveillance. And in the next few slides, I'll explore current and possible applications. One of the applications that probably has the most tangible short-term benefits is using genomics to uh, combine with phenotypic susceptibility results to conduct surveillance of antibiotic resistance mutations. And such surveillance may detect shifts in the prevalence and relative distribution of resistant mutations and also detect new mutations. And this, these can inform the development of molecular resistance assays. And also, particularly because Nicere gonorrhea mutates so readily, may identify when changes are needed to future assays to keep up with the rapidly evolving bug. One example of detection of a new resistance mutation is the identification of a ceftriaxone and ciprofloxin resistant uh, isolate labeled FC428 that had a novel PenA gene causing ceftriaxone resistance, later, later labeled PenA60. After first being detected in Japan in 2015, the strain circled the globe, was detected in the countries listed in the slide, and was able to be tracked through sequencing of these isolates. The phylogeny on the right shows the close relatedness of these isolates. Now, related to the example of the FC428 clone, I'm going to add also here monitoring of a spread of a strain as another possible application. <clears throat> now, tracking a strain with sequencing through time and space may prove useful uh, both internationally and domestically if done and reported in a timely manner. This surveillance could potentially alert public health officials in other geographic areas to be on the lookout for a particular strain and to prepare. But this bacterium, as you know, is not one for complacency. And sequencing allowed CDC to identify this follow-up of the FC428 and PenA story, PenA60 story with a new wrinkle. In late 2019, a urethral isolate was collected in Las Vegas and identified through GISP as having a high ceftriaxone MIC. Sequencing demonstrated that it had the same PenA60 allele that we discussed earlier, but as the phylogeny on the right demonstrates, this isolate is very distinct and distantly related to the FC428 clones. The, the PenA60 allele seems to have jumped in a, into a totally different lineage or group of strains. So not only can genomics allow us to monitor these kinds of developments more carefully, but it also gives us a glimpse into how these bacteria can mutate and evolve. Another possible application for surveillance is detection of outbreaks or clusters. And this is a common use, as I mentioned, with other non-SCI pathogens. While phenotypic susceptibility testing certainly allows us to detect individual isolates with resistance, sequencing can shed more light on whether the isolates are part of a single outbreak or due to multiple separate introductions. And it's possible that in the future that response approaches might differ. And in this way, we'll draw an example. In 2018, the Indiana Department of Health, as part of SURGE, identified 14 isolates as demonstrated high-level azithromycin resistance. The isolates were from 12 men that were represented in the network else in common. So the question was raised, was this just one cluster or were there multiple introductions of resistant uh, isolates, multiple uh, resistant infections that are unrelated? And the, this figure shows the phylogeny of isolates from Indiana collected in 2016 to 2018 that we can shed light on this. And I put a box around the, around the azithromycin resistant isolates. They're clustered tightly together and highly related. This strongly suggests that this was a single outbreak with a single emergence and then subsequent spread. Now the genomic findings did not change the local response and the clustering reflects what you might expect from the phenotypic data. However, it did provide some reassurance that it was a single outbreak as opposed to multiple introductions. Now there is some potential for leveraging genomic data from surveillance to better understand transmission dynamics namely how gonococcal infections spread through networks and populations. 
we may be able to better understand transmissibility and fitness of strains, and also epidemiologically how strains spread through populations and how quickly. Such approaches may inform transmission models and potentially prevention and control approaches. I also wanted to mention that Katie Town is a molecular epidemiologist on my team who's spearheading some of our work on this for gonorrhea genomics to understand sexual networks and transmission. Um, and how to translate genomics into public health action. And she has a poster at the conference that I highly recommend you check out related to this work. And I'm now gonna pivot from the theory gonorrhea to spotlight promising work being done by our colleagues at CDC in the laboratory branch on two other pathogens. They've had success sequencing T. pallidum from clinical specimens and from rabbit propagated isolates and of sequencing uh, chlamydia trachomatis from clinical specimens as well. And in the future, it's possible that genomics may have a role in identifying the boundaries of syphilis and LGV outbreaks uh, down the road. Now, before I conclude, I just want to mention a few additional considerations to address as we move forward in the realm of using genomics uh, for public health. As we explore transmission dynamics and outbreak detection, we need to keep in mind ethical issues and privacy concerns. When culture is used, the sequence does not contain any human DNA. And mutation rates of most STDs are low enough that it's unlikely uh, to be able to show directionality of transmission. But sequencing from clinical specimens and expanded sequences, um, as those move forward, we'll definitely need to keep these issues of ethics and privacy in mind. We'll need to tease out how to use genomics that are uh, for approaches that are impactful, worthwhile, and change what we do. And as we delineate the most impactful uses, we'll need to iteratively need to determine how quickly the data are needed and whether and whether that's feasible with current technology and what sample sizes are needed. And to expand the reach of genomics in surveillance, sequencing, perhaps targeted sequencing directly from clinical specimens rather than the culture will likely be necessary. And there, there are investigators working on this, as I mentioned before, including the T. pallidum and uh, C. trachomatis, but also with Nicere gonorrhea. Another question is who pays for sequencing? Uh, this may influence how much it can scale up. And currently sequencing and analysis of the data are largely centralized among academic researchers and at CDC at the moment. But if we identify ways in which sequencing changes the practice of local STD programs and is rapidly needed, then we may need to centralize, may want to centralize this work. So in conclusion, genomics holds promise for advancing STI surveillance and epidemiology, outbreak response, and programmatic approaches. Much has been accomplished, uh, especially in the area of monitoring resistance mutations, uh, but there's still much to be learned about how best to use genomics uh, approaches for STIs. And I'd like to thank all of these people and groups, and thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Jurgen Jensen. He is a consultant physician at uh, SSI, which is the Staten Serum Institute in Copenhagen, where he is heading the research unit for reproductive microbiology. His current focus is on N genitalium, antimicrobial susceptibility, aiming to improve treatment. He has contributed to the development of molecular assays for resistance detection by characterizing M genitalium strains from patients with treatment failure. He has been part of the European STI Guidelines Project editorial board since 2006 and was the lead author on the M genitalium guidance. Uh, take it away, York. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the use of antimicrobial resistance testing when treating mycoplasma genitalium and whether that is a luxury or a necessity. Before we begin, here are my disclosures. And the topics of my talk will be a brief introduction to mycoplasma genitalium, and then I'm going to talk about the antimicrobial resistance in mycoplasma genitalium concerning acetomycin and moxifloxacin, and that regards the mechanisms of re resistance, the epidemiology, and something about the detection of the resistance. And finally, I hope to conclude and uh, give you some ideas about the future needs. As many of you know, mycoplasma genitalium was isolated from two out of 13 men with non-gonococcal urotritis in 1980 by David Taylor Robinson. Here he's holding a squash with the same shape as a mycoplasma genitalium cell with the flask shape and the specialized tip structure adhering to the eukaryotic cell 
Detection of mycoplasma genitalium relies 100% on nucleic acid amplification tests because culture takes months and serology, at least in its present state, lacks sensitivity and specificity. However, today, mycoplasma genitalium has been an established cause of sexually transmitted infections, and it's only second to chlamydia tachomatis in prevalence in most settings, and in a few settings, it has actually been even more common than chlamydia. The recommended treatment for mycoplasma genitalium it has generally been azithromycin in an extended dose similar to that used in uh, pneumonia with mycoplasma pneumonia uh, with 500 milligrams on day one, followed by 250 milligram on the following four days. However, the US CDC 2015 guidelines recommended only one gram of azithromycin a single dose and to be honest, I think that is not the optimal treatment, and that is based primarily on a meta-analysis uh, on acetomycin treatment uh, conducted by Patty Horner and colleagues in 2017, showing that for each treatment with acetomycin one gram, 12% uh, of patients will select resistance and become macrolide resistant after the treatment. Whereas if they are treated with the extended regimen, only about 4% will develop resistance. So I think that is a clear evidence that extended dosing is better than the short dose. For second line treatment, moxifloxacin 400 milligrams um, once daily for seven days has been the standard uh, regimen. And for both uh, treatments, it has been shown that a high MG load increases the risk of treatment failure and for selection of resistance. This selection of resistance has been an increasing problem uh, worldwide and mycoplasma genitalium is now on the CDC watch list of antibiotic resistant threats in the United States. The knowledge about uh, high loads and high risk of selection of resistance led the Australians to develop what they call resistant guided sequential treatment the concept of this is that you treat the patient with seven days of doxycycline while you wait for the mycoplasma genitalium test results, including macrolide resistance mutation detection, and they used the commercially available SpeedX assay. While they were treating with doxycycline, they could show that the mycoplasma genitalium organism load was decreased by almost 2.6 log. Uh, in, in the first week of treatment. The macrolide susceptible infections were then treated with a high dose of azithromycin, 2.5 gram, with one gram on the first day, followed by 500 milligrams on day two to four. This resulted in a very low rate of selection of resistance in only 3.7% of the patients. And this should be seen in comparison with the historical data from the same uh, clinic where they had 12% macrolide resistance mutation uh, selection with the, even with the extended dose with 1.5 gram. Um, the um, uh, macrolide resistant infections were treated with moxifloxacin in the standard dose. And again, they obtained a a much better cure rate than would be predicted from the historical data with 92% uh, cured with this treatment. This is what has led the guidelines to change in both Australia and in the UK, and an example of an observational study that has changed the guidelines without having conducted a randomized control trial. So now the standard of cure in the UK and in Australia is a pretreatment with seven days of doxycycline followed by either two gram in the UK or 2.5 gram in Australia and moxifloxacin for seven days in Australia and 10 days in the UK. I think there are several questions that can, that can be raised about these recommendations because in my opinion, I would suspect that the 1.5 gram acetomycin dose would work equally well, but we need, to, we need to show that. The other thing is whether combination therapy would be an option because this um, 
uh, uh, sequential treatment leads to a very long treatment period in, in uh, macrolide resistance infections. It will be a full 14 days treatment in Australian uh, dosing and 17 days uh, with the UK regimen with 10 days of moxifloxacin. And this has implications for antimicrobial stewardship as well as for patient compliance. The global prevalence of macrolide resistance mutations is quite uh, varying from area to area. In the United States and, and North America, it's more than 50% in the studies that have been conducted, but they have mainly been conducted in STD clinics. So it's a high-risk population, and it could be uh, speculated if it would be lower in the general population. But similarly, uh, there are high uh, levels of resistance in Europe and in Australia, and in a recent publication from China, as many as 89% uh, of uh, STD patients in Nanjing had uh, resistance to macrolides. So a huge problem in, in that setting. Detection of macrolide resistance mutations is recommended in the European guidelines for all positive samples in order to guide the treatment. This is in order to limit uh, the use of moxifloxacin as well as to shorten the duration of infection. This. The use of moxifloxacin is a problem both in terms of antimicrobial stewardship but also because uh, a, a warning label has been applied to moxifloxacin and other fluoroquinolones, meaning that there would be legal considerations prescribing moxifloxacin to a patient that could actually be treated with acetromycin. There are several approaches for detection of the resistance, uh, and mainly the choice is depending on the laboratory capability and currently in the US, there's no FDA approved macrolide resistance test, but I know that the SpeedyX assay is under FDA review at the moment. And since they collaborate with Roche, uh, the, the COPA system may also uh, contain that in the future. So I would say that macrolide resistance testing is a necessity for optimal patient management and not just a luxury. Second line treatment, uh, is mainly with uh, moxifloxacin, 400 milligrams for seven or even 10 days. Uh, and in the early days, this used to be quite efficient with almost 100% efficacy during the first years of treatment, but then a gradual decline in the efficacy and nobody knows where this is going to end. The quinolone uh, resistance is uh, caused by quinolone resistance associated mutations or QRAMs. And the main determinant in, is in the topoisomerase 4, uh, the coded by the PAR-C gene, and mainly in positions S83 and D87. Uh, uh, it is believed that mutations in gyra A in the corresponding positions will lead to increased levels of um, minimal inhibitory concentrations, uh, leading to a higher uh, level of resistance. Unfortunately, many of acetomycin resistant uh, infections are also containing QRAMs. So for instance, in the US, uh, about 10 to 15% have dual resistance in many settings. And in Japan, as many as uh, 20 to 30% have dual resistance. And in the study from Nanjing, they found even 88% with dual resistance. And this is a huge problem because we don't have good uh, third line treatment eradicating infection in a uh, large proportion of patients. Fortunately, the QRAMs are not 100% predictive of treatment failure. Uh, and this is partly because of a wide range of MICs, uh, even with the high level resistance mediating QRAM causing the S83I mutation, which may vary between 1 and 16 milligrams per liter. And in the lower range, that would be 
probably treatable with uh, a high dose of moxifloxacin, whereas in the high end, they would be completely untreatable. These uh, changes are probably depending on the simultaneous uh, gyre A QRAMs. Also, not all QRAMs are equally important. The S83N uh, homologous am amino acid substitution appear not to increase MIC, and this is quite commonly observed in uh, Japan. And the reason for that selection is not really clear at the moment. The other thing is that we use the same dose of antimicrobial, uh, in this case, moxifloxacin, for all patients, regardless of weight. And my qualified guess would be that if this couple was treated with moxifloxacin, the tissue concentrations of moxifloxacin would be higher in the female partner than in the male partner. And that could have important implications for the eradication. The other thing is that our experience has mainly been based on uh, experience from um, Australia, where sequential therapy uh, makes the interpretation of treatment failure a little bit more difficult because when they treat with doxycycline before the moxifloxacin treatment, as many as 40% may be cleared already with the doxycycline treatment. And the other thing is that residual doxycycline could act synergistically with moxifloxacin for some mutations. QRAMs can be detected by sequencing of the PARC gene. This is quite straightforward, but it's a manual procedure. So qPCR assays for detection of the common mutations are under development. Uh, and, uh, and some assay producers have uh, prototype kits under development that have been published uh, already. Uh, however, I think that at this stage, the primary detection of QRAMs is not relevant because of the relatively poor prediction of treatment failure and because the alternative treatment strategies we have at the moment are suboptimal. On the other hand, detection of QRAMs is really relevant after moxifloxacin failure because that can determine whether we are dealing with a reinfection with a susceptible strain, which is not uncommon. And then we can reuse moxifloxacin, whereas if there's a true resistance, then we need a third line therapy. So is it a necess necessity? I really don't know. So in conclusion, I think that macrolide resistance testing should be part of all mycoplasmic genitalium diagnostic testing, whereas QRAM detection is helpful, but not at this stage a necessity. For future uh, aspects, I think that we need uh, culture to be considered for treatment failures, especially with a third line treatment, because that allows us to do subsequent MIC determination and this is essential to guide work on molecular diagnostics of uh, antimicrobial resistance. We need to bear in mind, however, that the MIC may not always correlate with the clinical effect, as is, is, is the example of, uh, of moxifloxacin. And then we need evaluation of new antimicrobials uh, very urgently. And with that, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues and collaborators and thank you for your attention. The next speaker is Rebecca Brotman, uh, is a, who's a professor of epidemiology and public health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine Institute for Genome Sciences. Over the past 15 years, she has developed a research career in various aspects of the human microbiome with an emphasis on women's health. Her research has ranged between the role of the vaginal microbiome in susceptibility to sexually transmitted infections and the behavioral and biological factors associated with the development of bacterial vaginosis. Rebecca? Thank you. Um, so I was asked today to talk about STIs and the microbiome. Um, and so with that, um, the outline for the talk today is to talk about the, the vaginal microbiota and how it provides protection uh, for the female reproductive tract. What is a disrupted vaginal microenvironment and what are optimal states? And just broadly speaking, uh, we know that lactobacillus species are considered protective. However, how could molecular and genomic data provide greater resolution? And so that's what I'm gonna speak about today. So just one slide on bacterial vaginosis. Um, 
uh, bacterial vaginosis is defined by a large relative abundance of a gamut of anaerobic bacteria, 100 a thousand fold higher than women without BV, and a low level of lactobacillus. And so what is it about these lactobacilli? How does the vaginal microenvironment protect against sexually transmitted infections? So lactobacillus species, broadly speaking, are considered keystone bacteria because of their ability to produce lactic acid through the fermentation of glycogen. Now, I could give an entire um, hour talk on mechanisms of protection, but this is just one slide with a few bullet points. Um, so I, um, lactic acid results in protection uh, through uh, lower vaginal pH and some other mechanistic um, um, uh, mechanisms. Um, lactic acid isomers appear to operate differentially, and I'll talk about that a little bit today. Um, the vaginal microbiota also offer resistance to co-colonization, and they produce other, other substances such as bactericins, biosurfactants, some physical things such as adherence to mucus and disruption of biofilms. And I'll talk about a little bit today about the metabolome, the metabolites in the vaginal microenvironment, um, inclu including um, uh, um, biogenic amines, which is an area of interest for our group. So I'd like to just um, start with some of the sentinel papers that have influenced me um, and my interest in this topic, starting in 1995 when Craig Cohen published on the cross-sectional association between BV and HIV seroprevalence. Um, Taha Taha soon followed with a, a longitudinal study looking at BV and, in, and incidence of HIV. Um, and Craig Cohen then followed with a really sentinel paper I felt on um, female to male transmission of HIV in which women who had bacterial vaginosis were more likely to transmit to their male partner. Um, more recently, there's been um, more studies coming online about the vaginal bacteria and specific taxa associated with increased risk for um, STDs. Here's one by um, Jared and, and McClellan's group on incidence of trichomonas, um, and one um, by Gossman and Kwan on um, incidence of HIV, on acquisition of HIV. And so there's just this, um, uh, a, the general field is, is showing this association, and I um, have endeavored to go a little bit farther with this. And um, these are the levels that I think about. And so when I was asked to talk about STIs in the microbiome, and this is sort of where I go to, um, there's a couple of levels where you can look at the vaginal microbiome in the microenvironment. The first is a survey of the bacterial species. So that's common, commonly what we think about with 16S RNA gene amplicon sequencing uh, that gives the, the species composition and relative abundance. Um, and then uh, you can go a little bit uh, to the next level, which is metagenomics, which is um, determining the microbial community gene content by sequencing all the genomic DNA. And so from there, you can get the survey and you can also get the what can they do. Um, some other levels that you can look at are the what are they doing, the metatranscriptomics, the metabolomics, the metaproteomics. And I'll touch on some of these aspects today in this short talk. So first, um, a heat map on the composition of the vaginal microbiota as determined by 16S RNA gene amplicon sequencing. Many of you may have seen similar heat maps to this, but just briefly, each line on the heat map corresponds to a single sample. This particular heat map has 13,000 samples that we pulled from across studies that um, my group has conducted in collaboration with Jacques Ravel, who's pictured here. And what this heat map shows is that the red is the high relative abundance of each of one of these uh, taxa. Now, the vaginal microbiome has hundreds of taxa. Um, here, we only show the, the, the top 20 or so. Um, but here, the, the red is the high relative abundance. Yellow is low relative abundance. But what you can immediately see using hierarchical clustering techniques is that there are what we call community state types, which separate these samples. Um, here is, C is CST1, uh, community state type 1, which is dominated by Lactobacillus crispatus. Here in CST3 is, lacto is dominated by Lactobacillus inners. Um, we have a group here dominated by Lactobacillus jensenii, Lactobacillus gasseri. And then CST4 is what our group uh, refers to as sort of the low Lactobacillus group. Here is separated by CST4A, which is BVAB1 and Gardnerella vaginalis. And then uh, CST4B, Gardnerella vaginalis, and adipobium, and CST4C by Streptococcus. Um, so these, um, this, the, this uh, Valencia is a tool that is now under review that will be uh, provide a reference set that others can come up with, uh, can use this tool to come up with similar community state types. And what I find remarkable about this work is that it's consistent among a large range of other studies um, listed here is just a few of them, but all studies are finding 
whether, however they cut these community state types, they're finding these relative um, um, uh, community state types dominated by these, these taxa. So I'm gonna talk about how we've deployed some of this work in NIH's longitudinal study of vaginal flora. Uh, the PI for this study uh, was a mentor of mine when I was a fellow, Mark Klebanoff, uh, when he was at NICHD, he's now in Ohio. The study was recruited in 1999 to 2002 um, by um, the clinical collaborators, Dr. Jane Schwebke and Bill Andrew um, at University of Alabama, Birmingham and 12 clinics. They collected vaginal lavages and surveys from over 3,600 women um, and um, um, ran uh, STD testing on all samples. Now, I just want to pause to, rem you know, I'm an epidemiologist by training, and that one of the issues with studying observational, conducting observational studies of incident STI is that you can't get an STD unless you're exposed to it. And so we have to um, pay very close attention to the risks of exposure. And in this study, um, we uh, used our models and tried to control for partner concordance, condom use, number of sex partners and new partners. So just briefly on LSVF, the, the cohort characteristics, 80% um, were African-American, um, about 25 years of age, 75% had less than a high school education. The incidence rate was quite high, 36 cases per 100 person years. Um, and this is the breakdown of the, each of the individual um, uh, STDs we'll be looking at, gonorrhea, trichomonas, um, um, and chlamydia. Um, for this particular presentation, I'm talking about the composite of all STDs, um, and uh, are, although we have conducted the individual pathogen analyses, um, and they were remarkably consistent. So this is the first slide um, um, describing the different community state types and the, the, odds, the odds for incident STI. In this particular slide, we have marked CST4A as the, the reference. Um, and what you can see is um, in comparison to women who are this BVAB1 and Gardnerellis dominated um, community state type, all of the lactobacillus dominated community state types provide protection, which is expected. But the question we had was whether each one of these community state types might provide differential protection. And in this particular study, although CST2 l dominated state was, had the lowest point estimate at 73% lower odds of STI, um, the, the different lactobacillus community state types were not significantly different from each other. But there's more data to come when we look at the metagenomics on the following slides. Um, but first, I get a lot of questions about our use of community state types because it is a data reduction mechanism and it is a categorical variable. And we have looked at the compositional analysis of the vaginal microbiota and incident STI, looking at individual taxon levels. And I worked here with um, uh, Michelle Chardell, who's a biostatistician, on using um, an, a, a compositional approach. Because what, what one of the issues with having, um, using relative abundance data is that um, what goes up must come down. So by definition, if you have a 90% relative abundance of crispatus, by definition, there is a low relative abundance of other things. And so those, the, the, there's some issues with the independence of those taxa. And so what this analysis does, um, and, and, and Michelle's published on it with other data, um, in the reference here, is that it basically holds the relative dominance of the remaining taxa constant. So what did we learn from this? We found that Prevotella, the taxa Prevotella was highly associated with, it, with uh, increased risk for um, STI. And, and of note, um, the lactobacilli, this is the area where there was statistical significant after adjustment for multiple comparison. And of note, the lactobacilli were not statistically significant after this adjustment. Um, and it's probably because they weren't, they're not different from each other in terms of their protection in, in our data set. And so that's why they didn't, they didn't pop. But this is still an active area that we're looking into. So um, the composition is, is, is informative, but what we really want to know is the function. And um, there's been a, um, a lot of, there's a, been a number of studies that have been pouring out on DNL lactic acid um, um, and the differential um, mechanisms that they might have for protection. And what you can see here is that the D isomer um, was higher in crispatus and gasseri and jensenai dominated community state types. And very interestingly, um, they were in the uh, um, LNers dominated community state types in the one in 3A, which is highly um, dominated by LNers and, and not as much by other things. It had a pretty high um, uh, D isomer. It, it does have some crispatus and jensenai. But here in the uh, 3B, where the, the, the relative abundance of, of LNRs is a little bit lower, 
the D isomer concentrations were lower. And so we've hypothesized that D lactic acid will provide increased protection against STIs um, based on these community state types. Oh, that's my, let's see, there we go. And so um, this is a visual, uh, it's a complicated visual to go over in a short talk, but basically what I would like to draw your attention to is the blue areas are areas of lower risk of, um, of incident STI. And what you can see right off the bat is that the, uh, this dark maroon circle are the um, l crispatus dominated women who are protected from incident STI. Um, and along the axis here is the D isomer, and along the axis here is the L isomer. And what we found in, this, in these models was that D-lactic acid was significantly associated with lower odds of STI, irrespective of the L-lactic acid concentration. Um, and uh, remarkably, the higher D-lactic acid concentrations have reduced odds of, of incident STI up here when they have higher relative abundance of crispatus gensoni and crispatus, I'm sorry, crispatus gensoni and gastri, which you can see on this axis here. And the reason why we split it out this way is so that we can see down here the l inners dominated women who did not have significant contributions of crispatus gensoni and gastri had very high risk of incident STI um, and did not have high D isomers. And so they did not crawl up this, this wall here with these other taxa that were a little bit more protective. And so that just illustrates those, um, those um, rust brown and orange l inners dominated samples. And so we so this might represent an area of, of interest to look into uh, these LNers dominated uh, samples. So um, another very interesting uh, revelation that we have in, had in this study was that um, we ran um, pan bacterial qPCR, which is, estimates the bacterial absolute abundance um, of the sample. So basically the bacterial load of the sample. And what we found was that within all of our community state types, women with higher absolute abundance had lower odds of STI. So in this community state type here, 4A and 4B, these are our low lactobacillus BV-like states. Women who had higher bacterial loads had lower risk for STI compared to those with lower loads, which was sort of counterintuitive to, a, counterintuitive to us because we expected higher loads would, would be worse. And so this, this suggested to us something about bacterial interference or a physical barrier and might have implications for feminine hygiene practices. So I have two more slides on, um, uh, I'll discuss metagenomics and the metabolomics. And so this is just layering on the different levels that we have used um, um, genomics to look at um, risk for incident STI. And here we looked at uh, the metagenomic CSTs, uh, uh, metagenomic subspecies in a smaller subset of women of cases, 306 cases. And we found um, what you'd expect, these uh, uh, sort of BV related and Gardnerella related um, uh, metagenomically defined community state types are a greater risk compared to our L. crispatus dominated community state types. But very interestingly, this L. inners subspecies here that we were able to detect with metagenomics was associ highly associated with incident STI compared to crispatus, and the point estimates were right in line with those other BV bacteria. Um, Streptococcus is another metagenomic CST that we identified here. Um, also of, of great risk. Um, one last slide on metabolomics. Um, um, these are very complicated data sets to analyze. There's 560 metabolites um, looking at th th 391 cases and 799 controls. Overall, what we found with our modeling, we found 15 metabolites associated with increased risk of STI and 130 associated with decreased risk. Um, there are a number of findings from this study, but the two that I'd like to, to hone in on was that cotinine was strongly associated with incident STI. And cotinine is a metabolite that's downstream from cigarette smoking. Um, and the other is the biogenic amines, um, which, which popped up here, which has been an, an area of active investigation uh, from Carl Yeoman's group in Montana about, um, and, they, um, and the suggestion is that they improve the growth and virulence of several of the pathogens. And these BAs were strongly associated with incident STI in our data set. So um, in summary, just overall, we found what you would expect, that the low lactobacillus community state types conferred the highest susceptibility. But interestingly, we were able to tease out some higher resolution on the different lactobacillus species. So lactobacillus gasteri was the most protect, pr protected state, but it also had very small numbers. L. crispatus had very strong protection and had higher numbers of women represented in the study. 
there might be some very clear strain specific risks with LNRs, which is a very common um, um, uh, taxa found in, in women. High concentration of D isomer of lactic acid was associated with lower risk of STI irrespective of L isomer. And so it's very important for those looking at lactic acid concentrations to start looking at those isomers. And some very intriguing data on this high bacterial abundance associated with lower odds of STI, suggesting perhaps something about um, bacterial interference or a physical barrier associated with the microbiome. Um, and then lastly, getting into metabolomics, looking at biogenic amines and cotinine. We also have some emerging data on the immunology of the sample that I didn't have time to go into. But broadly speaking, lactobacillus species are considered pr protective. However, how does this molecular and genomic data provide greater resolution and lead to interventions? This is, this is where we're headed with this topic. I'd like to thank uh, all of my collaborators, um, uh, Jacques Ravel, Michelle Chardel, Khalil Ganimut over at Hopkins, um, and the Montana State Group. And here's my email address and for any, any fellows out there looking for postdoctoral positions. Thank you. So our last speaker for the symposium is Yonatan Grad. He is the Melvin and Geraldine Glimcher Assistant Professor of Immunology and Infectious Diseases at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. His laboratory uses interdisciplinary methods, including genomics, epidemiology, and molecular microbiology to study how pathogens evolve and spread with the motivation of improving clinical and public health strategies to decrease the burden of disease. I'll turn over to you, Yonatan. Thank you very much, Matthew, and uh, a pleasure um, to be here. Thank you to um, the organizers and also to all the other speakers for the fantastic talks. Uh, okay, so um, I am going to, uh, uh, as, as suggested, uh, talk about um, genomics and antibiotic resistance. Mm -hmm. So uh, as we've been working on this, one of the, the, the main questions um, that we've been interested in is how can we slow or control the spread of drug-resistant gonorrhea? Now, right now, uh, we diagnose uh, gonorrhea through most, mostly through nucleic acid amplification tests, and then we treat uh, empirically. So we don't have, at the time of treatment, any information on the antibiotic susceptibilities. But um, if we did, perhaps we can uh, help slow uh, the spread of drug-resistant gonorrhea. And uh, one thought is that expanding on the nucleic acid amplification tests and looking at those genetic loci that might help us predict antibiotic susceptibility and resistance, uh, we could, uh, in fact, um, uh, improve uh, from the empiric treatment. So we're very interested in trying to see how can we do this? How can we actually build a repertoire and understanding of how we can move from genotype to phenotype? So uh, the question basically becomes what variants contribute to resistance and are there in fact other modulators of antibiotic resistance phenotype uh, that we should be aware of? And for this talk, I'll focus on, on our work on azithromycin and ceftriaxone as those are uh, at least um, uh, for, for now, uh, the therapies recommended for treatment of Neisseria gonorrhea infections. So in work that we did um, several years ago, uh, um, we uh, evaluated how much of resistance for azithromycin, for example, was uh, attributable to mutations either in the target of azithromycin, the 23SR RNA, or in an efflux pump known to pump azithromycin out of uh, the cell and contribute to um, uh, antibiotic resistance, and that's the uh, MTR CDE pump. And what we saw was that about two thirds of azithromycin resistance were attributable to those mechanisms, but about one third of resistance, and that's primarily lower level resistance, uh, was unexplained. So um, as I'll go through this talk, I'll describe several of the different ways in which we use genomics to help us understand and discover a genetic basis of resistance. So one of the first approaches that we've taken to trying to get at uh, uh, this um, uh, unexplained resistance is genome-wide association studies. So uh, here, what we're doing basically is applying a similar kind of framework as has been used for understanding the genetic basis of various human traits, uh, and here applying it to, to bacteria. So um, as you may be familiar with, for, for humans, we take uh, our cases and our controls, and we look for genetic variants that are overrepresented in our cases as compared to the controls. And that um, essentially helps us identify what might be the genetic basis of uh, the phenotype of interest. For bacteria, we're basically doing the same thing, where uh, here we're looking to discriminate between resistance and 
mobility. Uh, and we have to uh, cope with um, the, the challenge of population structure, uh, where many of the different isolates that we observe may be closely related to one another. Uh, and here uh, I am indebted um, to Bob Kirkaldi for introducing many of these concepts uh, about the relatedness of bacteria and phylogenetic trees in, in his talk. So, so thank you, Bob. So what we do here is um, account for population structure using a linear mixed model. Uh, so this is a little bit of math. And um, this is, in fact, when we're using genomics, we're incorporating these statistical approaches uh, and mathematical approaches um, with genome sequences and our antibiotic resistance phenotypes. So here uh, in this equation, we have our phenotype. Uh, we have the contribution of the genetic variant uh, that we're testing. Uh, we have a random effect parameterized by the genetic relatedness matrix, which basically accounts for that population structure, uh, and then random error. Um, so in other words, what we're trying to do here is account for the fact that these isolates are not independent of one another, and that two very closely related isolates we don't want to count separately. We want to, uh, again, uh, account for their relatedness. So uh, we put together uh, a meta-analysis collection of nearly 5,000 5, strains. Uh, again, as Bob mentioned, there's been uh, a lot of work recently with large collections uh, of clinical isolates in SCR gonorrhea that have undergone sequencing. And in fact, these are isolates that have been sequenced from around the world from across several decades. So we assembled uh, all of these into one collection, um, and that is represented here in this phylogenetic tree. Uh, and then in the annotation rings, we have a representation of uh, resistance patterns for superfloxacin, uh, ceftriaxone, and zithromycin. And then we use this data and feed it into our uh, <coughs> um, genome-wide association study. Uh, and um, here we plot a uh, Manhattan plot where on um, the x-axis we have uh, the genome coordinates uh, and on the y-axis the negative log of the p-value uh, for each of the variants that we considered. Uh, and um, what we found was a variant that contributed to um, uh, resistance to azithromycin after accounting for variants that contributed that we knew about, so those in that efflux pump uh, that I mentioned, as well as in um, the RNA, uh, excuse me, the, the ribosome um, uh, that were targets of uh, azithromycin. Accounting for those, we end up finding uh, as our strongest hit um, this mutation in uh, RPLD. Uh, RPLD, which is uh, 50S ribosomal protein L4. Uh, and so this became um, uh, our top candidate for a novel resistance mutation. So working then from uh, this uh, candidate uh, identified by genomics, we went in and experimentally validated it um, so introduced uh, the mutation and then uh, demonstrated that transformants that specifically only had this mutation had an increased uh, azithromycin MIC. Uh, so we can uh, now, uh, and we showed actually that there were several other mutations uh, around uh, position 70 um, that also seem to contribute to, to azithromycin resistance. So we're starting to expand our understanding um, of the different genetic basis of of azithromycin resistance uh, through these approaches. Now, another way that we've been doing this is trying to complement work that um, other groups have been doing uh, and so really build on uh, data generated from many different ways. So in a recent paper uh, by Liu, Moseng, and all, uh, so from the labs of Bill Schaefer and at Yu, um, they looked at the crystal structure of this MTR-CDE um, uh, uh, protein, or excuse me, the cryo-EM, specifically looking at MTRD, which is the inner membrane component uh, that picks up um, uh, uh, substrate in the periplasm and then starts it on its way out, so pumping it out through the C-flux pump. And what they identified looking at this cryo-EM was that there were a couple of sites, particularly um, at position 714 and 823, that seemed to contribute to azithromycin uh, resistance. So um, again, using our large data set of clinical isolates, we could then query, um, do we find any of these variants actually in, in the clinical population uh, and where uh, the majority have of clinical isolates uh, are wild type at both of these amino acids, uh, we did find uh, several that had different variants um, at these positions and that these are all associated with uh, increased 
azithromycin MICs. And what we can see as well is that these have arisen many different times across uh, the phylogeny. So these are independent acquisitions of these MTRD mutations that contribute to azithromycin resistance. So for this section, the summary is that GWAS can in fact help us find contributors to resistance. Uh, we identified one in uh, this RPLV70 mutation, uh, and that in fact this population genomics approach can complement structural biology and, uh, and we think other types of data um, to identify clinically relevant uh, um, variants, in this case MTRD714 and 823. Now, for ceftriaxone, uh, the majority of resistance has been identified in uh, the gene PEN-A, which codes for penicillin binding protein 2, the primary target of ceftriaxone. But uh, we also saw that there were a number of isolates that did not have uh, mutations in PEN-A, but did have elevated uh, uh, MICs or increased resistance to cetrioxone. So we were interested uh, in trying to understand what is going on uh, with these isolates. And here, one of the benefits of the genomics is that it really gives us a sense of how related uh, these various isolates are, where they are on the tree, and an opportunity to start to uh, um, approach them experimentally. Um, so here, for example, are three of these isolates, uh, GC, GS, 1013, 1095, and 1014, uh, where these two in particular uh, had among the highest MICs for cephalosporins um, in this data set. So uh, what we did to try to discover what the genetic basis is of resistance um, uh, was to take an experimental approach where we take uh, DNA from our resistant donor, purify it, transform a susceptible recipient, select for resistance transformance, and then use genome sequencing to identify the mutations uh, that then uh, we could demonstrate through, again, an experiment where we put them back in that they actually cause resistance. Um, so for this, we used as our recipient another isolate that we had identified as being very closely related genetically. So we're trying to control for other things in the genome that might influence uh, or modulate the extent of resistance or the propensity to become resistant in this kind of transformation approach. Uh, and when we did this, we discovered a single single nucleotide polymorphism in RPOB, a subunit of the RNA polymerase. This was uh, a SNP that led to a coding change and an amino acid uh, change from uh, R to H at position 201. We then put that back in and validated that it, in fact, on its own was sufficient to increase uh, the ceftriaxone resistance. Uh, so we wondered, okay, well, this is a little bit unusual. This is an RNA polymerase mutation. Uh, we haven't really seen these before for cetrioxone resistance. What about these other two isolates, GCGS 1013 and 1014? Well, we took the same kind of approach. And here we found a mutation uh, in RPOD, another component of the RNA polymerase um, that uh, we showed also uh, contributed to resistance. Uh, and then a, a third variant, in this case, a deletion from amino acids 92 to 95 of our POD that also uh, led to reduced susceptibility to cetrioxone. So uh, all three of these, uh, I should say, are near each other when you look at the overall RNA polymerase complex. Um, so it, even though they uh, are mutations in two different genes, when you think about the overall complex and how it acts, uh, these look like they're, they're actually fairly similar to one another. So you might ask, uh, these are only a few examples, how clin clinically important uh, are these variants? Well, we looked at uh, a wide array of gonococcal isolates from across the phylogeny and tried transforming them using these variants. And we found that, in fact, many of these uh, clinical isolates indicated by these uh, arrowheads um, are capable of acquiring these mutations and with these mutations uh, transforming from being susceptible to being uh, resistant. So, uh, in fact, many different clinical isolates are just a single single nucleotide polymorphism from developing reduced susceptibility to through this pathway. Uh, <clears throat> we also found, as we searched through the database, uh, another isolate, this one from the United Kingdom that are reported from London, uh, that has uh, developed this RNA uh, 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 polymerase um, mutation in RPOD, again, this deletion from 92 to 95, independently, it's down here, whereas the isolates that uh, we've been characterizing are up here, so another 
branch of the phylogeny, uh, and it independently acquired this mutation. We predicted just on the basis of what we had seen previously uh, with this mutation that it would confer reduced susceptibility. And when our colleagues in the UK tested the MIC, it in fact was, uh, was elevated as we predicted. So population genomics uh, can help us identify uh, isolates that have unexplained resistance. Uh, and here we show that we've used this approach to discover RNA polymerase mutations uh, that can lead to ceftriaxone resistance in gonococcus, and that many isolates across multiple different genomic backgrounds have developed or are at risk of developing these RNA polymerase mutations, making them something that we'd want to maintain surveillance uh, uh, for and to track and see whether uh, these uh, lineages uh, may be expanding. Now, uh, sometimes you go searching for resistance determinants and find something totally different. In this case, uh, we found genetic variants that actually increase antibiotic susceptibility. So again, returning to the GWAS that I mentioned, we had this meta-analysis of many different isolates. Uh, and when we did a GWAS, well, a genome-wide association study looking for uh, variants that modulate the extent of resistance, we were looking for things and expected to find uh, things that increased resistance. Those are our resistance determinants. What we were surprised to find was a variant in a gene called MTRC, again, part of this uh, MTRCD efflux pump, uh, that actually increased antibiotic susceptibility. Uh, and this appeared in our GWAS uh, looking for modulators of uh, resistance for both uh, azithromycin and ceftriaxone, as well as for ciprofloxacin. So it really seemed to impact uh, antibiotic susceptibility to multiple different drugs. So um, we were then able to show, looking at all of these isolates, that it contributes to susceptibility even in the presence of resistance determinants. So uh, even when you have, um, an, for azithromycin, um, this increased expression of the efflux pump, uh, when you have this loss of function mutation that we observed in MTRC, uh, um, it decreases the MIC. Uh, and when you have the PEN-A variants that increase the MIC to ceftriaxone, well, when you have, again, this MTRC loss of function, the MICs go down. And the same thing as well for resistance uh, determinants for ciprofloxacin. So um, why, why would this happen? So Neisseria gonorrhea is an obligate human pathogen, which means that it must be something within the host environment that incurs a, a where, where this efflux pump activity incurs a fitness cost. Something in this environment is actually selecting against the pump. So we thought, okay, what, what could that be? Well, the bug only lives in a few different sites. So first in two different sexual networks. So we've got men who have sex uh, with women, and women who have sex with men, so the heterosexual network. And then we have uh, uh, the sexual network of men who have sex with men. Uh, and there are a few different anatomical sites where we can consider uh, a variety of differences. And in fact, uh, as we heard um, from Rebecca's talk that there even the cert, calling it one niche is, is inaccurate. There are many different uh, um, potential environments even within the cervical site. Um, so further complicating this, but starting to make us wonder, well, maybe there would be um, some association with one of these sites. So in fact, uh, as we looked at that, there, there was an association. So as we um, took this variant, the loss of function uh, variant in MTRC, uh, we could see that, in fact, it was uh, overrepresented in heterosexual networks and, and in uh, uh, women of sex with men in particular, um, as compared uh, to the other networks. And this was both in this global collection that we started with and with a validation data set that we um, uh, worked with, um, thanks to our uh, Australian collaborators. So then we looked at anatomical site. Uh, and uh, we saw that these variants are way overrepresented in uh, the cervical site as compared to the other sites, suggesting something in the cervical environment is selecting against these pumps, or in this case, selecting for these loss of function mutations that increase antibiotic susceptibility. So we have a hypothesis that this has to do with the fact that these pumps uh, are proton substrate antiporters. And in anaerobic conditions, uh, the influx of protons becomes much more difficult to deal with them. So it leads to cytoplasmic acidification, which uh, the cells have uh, difficulty with in terms of maintaining homeostasis. And we wonder whether, in fact, the cervical environment uh, and uh, 
potentially in some environments, lower pH may exacerbate this fitness cost. Uh, and so this led to the, the hypothesis that if there were other uh, similarly acting pumps, we would see that they might have the same kind of characteristics. And in fact, we discovered here that another pump uh, in gonococcus, the other one that's the proton substrate antiporter type, uh, FAR-AB, which pumps out fatty acids, um, has a loss of function version, um, in this case, a loss of function in FAR-A. And that this loss of function is also overrepresented in heterosexual networks and also represent, overrepresented in the cervix, lending credence to this hypothesis that something in that environment uh, is interacting with this type of pump potentially, again, through this method of uh, intracellular acidification. And this is now something we're trying to uh, validate experimentally. So uh, here, population genomics um, can uh, identify unexplained susceptibility. And we have these loss of function mutations uh, in these pumps uh, that uh, increase antibiotic susceptibility and appear adaptive to pressures in the cervical environment. Uh, can we use these findings to improve genotype based diagnostics. Uh, Walter Demchuk, uh, David Ayer, and others have developed uh, linear models where we try to pull all of these variants together. Uh, and you can imagine expanding nucleic acid amplification tests to query a number of different loci, and from this predict MIC. Uh, and we should expect uh, that there will be more unexplained resistance that arises, uh, and we can start to think about how much surveillance you need to do to pick them up, uh, and what factors influence the amount of surveillance. Um, so we developed an equation uh, to try to get at um, what kind of sampling you would need in order to pick up uh, these variants prior to some number of uh, cases. So if you want to pick it up before a small number of cases, you need to do a lot of sampling, uh, for example. This uh, basic framework treats all isolates as independent. Um, so we went on to look at what about if we try to improve our efficiency from random sampling by looking at patient characteristics or pathogen characteristics. And in a recent paper uh, led by Ali Hicks, uh, one of the graduate students in the lab, um, uh, we showed that, in fact, pathogen characteristics may be uh, uh, helpful, whereas pa patient characteristics not so much in improving um, our efficiency in picking up new resistance determinants. So there are many different uh, open questions um, uh, on, uh, in this area, uh, which uh, I'd be happy um, uh, to discuss with anyone who is interested, uh, and uh, I will... Uh, end with just uh, a plug for um, a talk by uh, Tata Mortimer, a uh, postdoc in the lab, um, who will talk about some of the other things that we do on uh, genomic epidemiology and trying to understand uh, spread and the drivers of spread in metropolitan centers. Uh, with that, um, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, all the folks in my lab and collaborators. Uh, thank you for your attention. Um, and again, uh, thanks to the organizers uh, for the opportunity.